This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. I want to cover something real quick before I really launch into my sermon. It says in the Gospel that the Pharisees and all Jews, blank, blank, blank. I want you to know, can you imagine how you'd feel if somebody said, all Episcopalians do this? Because you know darn well that even in this service, there's at least 18 ways to do almost everything that we do, right? I understand, and I have it on good authority, that it was no different for Jews in Jesus' time. The number of things that all Jews did, because remember, the message there is ultimately trying to set up a block and a barrier that we're different than them. And so that's why I think it's always important to just remind us when we hear an overgeneralization like that, it's just like the overgeneralizations that we don't like to hear about us, okay? Now, let's back the, back the truck up a little bit. About 3,000 years, Moses is talking to the people of Israel. He is giving them a review. Perhaps they're reviewing for their test before they enter into the promised land, right? And he's just about to launch into a review of all of the commandments that they've already received, but in the book of Deuteronomy, it's being reviewed. And he tells them, take heed and pay attention to all of these things that I'm going to teach you so that you may live to enter the land that God is giving you. Pay attention and follow these rules so that you might make it. And at the end of that particular passage, he says, watch yourselves carefully, therefore. And I think it's very important. Moses is reviewing the law to them. He's asking them to pay attention because it's worth their life. And he's asking them to watch themselves carefully. The reason this is so important, because the law really is significantly important. The law, the teaching, the commandments, the Torah, however you want to say it, we tend to think of it like the Ten Commandments, right? And, and I want to suggest, first of all, that I'd like you to think of it in a different way. Moses is reminding them of a love story. It's almost as if this is the anniversary of their marriage, and Moses is reviewing what brought them together and how their lives are to be care, caring for each other. Because the relationship is between God and the people of God. And the commandments, the teaching, the Torah are a sign and a part of the covenant between them in that relationship. So I have to tell you that I am one person who is usually offended when I see somebody take a Ten Commandments and stick it up on the wall, whether it's in a classroom, a courtroom, a bar, or any place else. Because it takes the law, which is a covenant and a sign of a relationship between God and the people of God, and turns it into just a set of good advice. That if people followed this, we'd be a better country. And I think it is what we call in the Bible, idolatry because the law divorced from the relationship between God and the people of God is simply another idol to be worshipped instead of God. So I'm just suggesting that Moses is reviewing the love story between the people of God and God and reviewing the law with them and then telling them to pay close attention to themselves. Now, let's move a thousand years up. Jesus is with his disciples. And it says that a group of Pharisees and some scribes have come up from Jerusalem to check him out in some way, right? Jerusalem is about 100 miles, more or less, from where Jesus is right now. So it's almost as if all of the clergy from the cathedral in San Diego have trekked 130 miles out to the desert to check out St. Paul in the desert. And so they're watching us very carefully. And you know, they're standing there very stiffly as people from the cathedral always do, right? <laughs> Is Chris and Wayne here? Because we have cathedral members who are here too. Um, 
And then after the service, they probably all have iPads too, and they've been making notes of all of the things that they observe during the service. And they come up to me afterwards, because Jesus is not close at hand, so they're working with me on this one. Um, They come and say, Father Andrew. And they would very definitely say, Father Andrew. We have noticed that some of your people are going forward to communion without first crossing themselves, as is the tradition of our elders and the way it's always been done. More importantly, it's the way we do it at the cathedral and we teach everybody. So why do you teach your people not to honor the traditions of the elders? Do you have any idea how you'd feel if somebody from the cathedral came and was talking to us like that? Do you think how I would feel? I still remember when there was one fellow who claimed to be a bishop who came in and he had the temerity to tell me that my wife was too poorly dressed to be the rector's wife. That was an interesting encounter. I'll just leave it at that. And um, he wasn't actually a bishop, but he kind of claimed he was a bishop. But, uh, but he had the shirt. Uh, so here's the thing. Those folks that Jesus is encountering, the Pharisees and some scribes, have pointed out something to Jesus. They've pointed out a tradition that has been helpful to them that in the course of their work, they wash their hands before they eat, not just because of sanitation, because they really didn't think of sanitation like we do. It was as a way of making the act of eating holy. Now, you would think that they always did it that way too, but I can guarantee you they didn't always do it that way, nor did any group that had it as their tradition do it all the time that way. But here's the real thing. They somehow decided that God had appointed them to clear up things in Galilee with Jesus. But the teaching from Deuteronomy says, therefore, pay close attention to yourselves. And this all ties in with what Jesus was talking about. See, there is nothing that comes from without that by going inside us is going to defile us. So if you happen to watch the wrong uh, version of news on the television, it's not going to defile you, okay? If you watch too much of the right one, it's not necessarily going to defile you. But the idea is, is that when all of a sudden you take that in, or you take anything in, and it turns you to a place where you're now spewing out things that are hateful to people. Now, I've got to work licentiousness in here. We don't use licentiousness as a rule in polite conversation or in any conversation, but I love the sound of the word so much that I've got to use licentiousness a couple times. There are other words that I like in this list, but I'm not going not to bore you with all those. But it's when the things that we start thinking about what other people ought to do based on the traditions that have, we found helpful that we begin having problems and we begin to be defiled. Because what Moses has done is Moses and God have been giving to the people a covenant that is something that they treasure because it reminds them of their relationship and it invites them to act in a certain way because they have this relationship with God. And these folks, these few folks from Jerusalem who have come out to Jesus have taken what was really a great thing and turned it into a stick to beat other people with. They have turned it from something that was inviting the people of God to prepare themselves to enter the promised land of God into something that's designed to set up a barrier to prevent people from getting to the promised land. So instead of the law being something that would help us prepare ourselves to enter God's gifts to us, It's taking and using the law as a way to remind everybody how different and unacceptable they are in God's sight and how unwelcome they are. Now, it was not just these folks who do these kind of things. We Episcopalians can do this too. I absolutely have nothing against the cathedral. Susan and I worship there on a vacation. We love worshiping there, but I thought I'd use them as kind of the straw straw priest 
in this, in this deal. But what are the ways that churches traditionally do this? Tradition, churches traditionally do this by having pews that belong to individuals. And you happen to want to welcome people, and we tell everybody and all sorts of things that we welcome them, welcome them, and they wander into church and they have the temerity to sit in the wrong pew. We used to have a woman who would get up and go, if somebody was in her pew, she would tap and say, sorry, you're in my pew, please move. In that case, pews become something that if you don't know, you're an outsider because you don't know the right place to sit. And the Episcopal, Episcopal Church has lots of things like that. We have people who cross themselves. We have people who don't. We have people who kneel for communion. We have people who stand. We have people who take the bread and drink the cup. We have people who dip. We have people who don't have the same kind of bread that everybody else does. And we have people who only do one out of three of those possible things. And they might do something different on another week. And somebody walks in, and depending on who they walk up next to, somebody can let them know that, oh, that's the wrong way to take communion. We set up barriers to people, ways to keep people from being a part of our body. So things that come from without don't defile us, but the things that come within, when we work out our own issues using the things of God, whether it's the law, whether it's our liturgy, whether it's the pews we sit in, that's when things like avariciousness, folly, and pride start spewing out, setting up barriers to building the, the kingdom of God. But I want to tell you there's good news behind all this. Because even though nothing from outside that comes in can defile us, things that are outside of us can come in and help us out. Most people come to church because they hope to hear the word of God. So the scripture being read comes from outside. We hear it and we make it a part of our lives and it can encourage us and lift us up. Every one of you is going to be invited to come forward to receive communion. And we can receive the body and blood of Christ and the life and very essence of Christ as something that draws us closer and closer and makes us more and more into that. And so instead of things like avarice, greed, adultery, and licentiousness coming out of us, what if things like peace, love, joy, generosity, courage were the things that came out of us? I think that's what happens when we come forward and we receive communion, when we hear the word of God, when we open ourselves by receiving the welcome of others and participating in fellowship with one another. Because that love affair that God, through Moses, was reminding the people of Israel about is the love affair that we continue to share this day. Every time we come to this, this church, we are reminded and invited to renew that relationship with God. And we're invited to pay attention to ourselves about the things that we need to do to move closer and closer in that relationship. And the sign that we're moving off track is when we begin to be more interested in what other people are doing in their relationship with God. The corrective is to come to the communion receive Christ, and then begin to open ourselves up to receiving the love, joy, peace, courage, gentleness that are being shared around us. So from 3,000 years ago, Moses reminding the people of Israel, to 2,000 years ago, Jesus setting those folks who came to tell him how he ought to be doing it straight to our own day where God invites us to be people of peace, joy, love, not people of all the things that we would be defiled by. And our worship together is the place that gives us strength and connections to keep moving in the right direction. Amen.